Yeah, so um, this is the final presentation for a DTC visitor project uh, with Christina Stan and her graduate student, Lauren Doyle. And Lauren is a master's student at uh, George Mason University, and her main focus is on climate modeling and particularly the Matt and Julian oscillation and its interactions with the El Nino Southern Oscillation and the uh, climate model's ability to predict those relationships. So um, I'll send it over to you, Lauren, and we can start. All right. Um, so this presentation is titled Evaluating the MJO ENSO Relationship Using UFS Reforecasts and the Impact of Skin Layer Variability on this Relationship. Um, so, as a uh, background, my name is Lauren Doyle. I'm graduating with a master's in climate science with concentration in climate modeling from George Mason this spring. My advisor is Christina Stan. I participated in the DTC visitor program last year and had two visits, one in spring 23 and the other in summer. I assisted with the development of a use case for MetPlus in which the Make and Mackey indices can be applied to read forecast data. The base code of the Make and Mackey use case is what I'm using for my thesis. So to show an example of how the results of this use case should look, I'm presenting my research. The Make and Mackey indices are a set of metrics for El Nino event prediction and MJO influence designed by Nick Leibarger that quantify the MJO and SO relationship. To provide some background, I will briefly introduce MJO and SO, their relationship and how the indices work. So the Madden Julian Oscillation, abbreviated MJO, is a tropical 30 to 90 day intraseasonal oscillation. It's an eastward propagation of suppressed and enhanced anomalous convection in zonal winds coupled over the tropical Pacific Ocean, and it has eight phases. The figure to the right shows the eight phases of the MJO propagation, um, starting with enhanced convection uh, over the Indian Ocean and suppressed over at least the Western tropical Pacific Ocean. As the oscillation propagates, the suppressed convection um, moves further east and the enhanced convection crosses the maritime continent. Then a suppressed convection system forms um, over the Indian Ocean and moves across the maritime continent following the path. The enhanced convection forms again over the Indian Ocean and the oscillation repeats at the time scale of 30 to 90 days. It's the dominant mode of interseasonal variability in boreal winter with a secondary peak in boreal spring, and it has a direct impact on weather and climate in the tropics and extratropics, making it a source of seasonal to subseasonal predictability. And it's also known to interact with other modes in the tropics, such as ENSO. El Nino Southern Oscillation, or abbreviated ENSO, is a two to seven year coupled air seat interannual oscillation in the tropical Pacific. Uh, has warm and cold phases that are separated by neutral conditions. The top figure here illustrates the warm phase El Nino showing the flatter thermocline, um, which allows warm sea surface temperature anomalies from the warm pool to shift towards the central um, Pacific and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. The bottom figure illustrates the cold phase La Nina showing a steeper thermocline, um, which keeps the warm pool in the Western Tropical Pacific Ocean and strong upwelling in the Eastern Tropical Pacific Ocean, which results in colder sea surface temperature anomalies. So there exists a correlation in the equatorial Pacific between ENSO and MJO forcing of ocean Kelvin waves, such that MJO winds can force Kelvin waves, which trigger the onset of El Nino events. And this, in summary, is the MJO and SO relationship. Um, there's a effect that the MJO wind stress can only influence ENSO in the equatorial waveguide of the forced Kelvin wave, which means that the, even when MJO Kelvin wave and ENSO covariance exists, the ENSO event is not always influenced by the MJO. Um, and it's also possible that MJO enhances ENSO warming in the early growth stage of April. As mentioned previously, the make and Mackey indices are used to describe this relationship. The make index stands for the MGO Kelvin wave and so covariance. Um, 
It has a threshold of negative 0.5 standard deviations in April, which is the month of the most predictive uh, power for the indices. Above the threshold, a given year is more likely to result in an El Nino, and below, it's less likely. MACD stands for the MGO Kelvin Weight Influence Index. It has a threshold of less than negative two standard deviations for determining whether the predicted El Nino will be strongly influenced by MGO. And the figure on the right uh, comes from the Liebarger output and also shows an example of the output of the Make and Mackey use case for observation data in NetPlus. It shows a time series of Make, which is the red line, and Mackey, which is the blue, from 1988 to 2016, measured in amplitude of standard deviation. The El Nino years are highlighted with the um, background shading. The events that are strongly influenced are shaded red, and the events that are not are in gray. The threshold uh, are indicated by the horizontal um, lines here, the blue corresponding with Mackey and the red corresponding with Meek. And April is indicated by the vertical lines, um, the vertical red lines. So the two questions I'm addressing in this study are, one, can models predict MJO and ENSO events and forecast the MJO and ENSO relationship? And two, does the inclusion or exclusion of the near sea surface temperature model in models impact the MJO and so relationship? Um, so the data I'm using, I have a reanalysis data set where I'm using as an observation and a model data set. The reanalysis data set comes from uh, CFSR um, for the period of April 1990 to March 2021, the variable sea surface temperature zonal meridional currents, the zonal meridional wind stress, and it's on a one degree regular grid on the tropical Pacific Ocean domain. The daily anomalies for this reanalysis period were obtained from the NOAA CPC. For the model, I'm using two prototypes from UFS GCM, uh, prototype six in which the NSSTM is turned off and prototype eight where it's turned on. The data consists of 35 day leads initialized on the first of each month with 84 forecast total per prototype. The period of analysis was from April 2011 to March 2018 with the initial conditions of 3D variational data assimilation for the Climate Prediction Center data, the same variables as the reanalysis and on the same resolution. This little bit of background about UFS, it is the Unified Forecast System Global Coupled Model it is the source system for NOAA's weather prediction operations. It's a coupled atmosphere, ocean, sea ice waves model, and prototypes five through eight are the current experimental versions of it. As previously stated, prototype six does not use an NSSTM, but prototype eight does. And the inclusion of the NSSTM in UFS has shown a positive impact on ocean atmosphere interactions for weather prediction timescales. And I'm only using the initializations on the first of every month because initialization in the middle of the month can interfere with ENSO monthly averaging. I performed some pre-processing um, during my data download for UFS, um, where I take the six hourly uh, data and I resample for daily means. I regrid from the, the quarter degree tripolar grid to the CFSR grid, and the daily anomalies are calculated as a difference from the model climatology. As a disclaimer, the CFSR anomalies were calculated by the CPC and the anomaly calculation methods were not provided, so it's possible that the methods are different for the observations in the model. Therefore, robust conclusions cannot be made on the model's prediction ability compared to the observations. So in part one, I address my first question and I perform a case study for the 2015-2016 El Nino event since there's only one El Nino event and one marginal event in the UFS period. To address the question, the, first, uh, the following analysis is performed. First, I filter the wind stress anomalies for interseasonal variability. Then I calculate the MGA component of wind stress, the Kelvin uh, wave activity of the surface currents, and the MGA wind power, which is the dot product of the MGA wind stress and the Kelvin waves. I use a pattern correlation of the model with the observation to determine the model's prediction. Next, I calculate the SST anomalies in the Nino 3 region and use pattern correlation for prediction. Last, I calculate the make and Mackey indices. 
The caveat of using subseasonal forecasts is that traditional filtering methods cannot be applied due to the length of the forecast being less than 90 days. This can be addressed using um, artificial intelligence methods. A framework and application of deep learning filtering based on a convolutional neural network, or CNN, was developed by Stana Machapagata to isolate interseasonal variability in observations in seasonal 90-day forecasts. Through modifications to the CNN architecture, this filtering approach can be used on subseasonal forecasts such as UFS. The modifications include decreasing the kernel size of the convolutional layers to match the target sample size. So the first convolutional layer would decrease from 90 to 35, and the second layer would decrease from 30 to 15. And tuning the hyperparameters of the CNN, in this case, I increased the learning rate of the atom optimizer from 0.001 to 0.005 to compensate for the decreased kernel sizes. In this way, 30 to 90 day signals can be retained from subseasonal forecasts without a loss of variability. The performance of the CNN-based filter is assessed using the set of metrics shown here. The figures in the top show um, for daily zonal wind stress anomalies, the total anomalies, the Lankosh filtered anomalies, aka the truth, the CNN filtered anomalies, and the difference between the filters. A pattern correlation between the CNN filter and the truth is, point, or is 0 0.95 indicating that the CNN filter performs well and retains the interseasonal variability in CFSR. The bottom set of figures shows the time, um, shows the time series of the filtered wind stress anomalies, um, the power spectral density by frequency, the index of agreement, and the root mean squared error. The Lankosh filter in these two plots is the red line, and CNN is the blue. The time series shows agreement in um, between the filters during boreal spring and summer during this era, and less agreement in boreal autumn and winter, so this area here. Um, the CNN signal for the power spectral density by frequency is slightly stronger around 30 to 40 days. Um, but is weaker around 7 to 90 days, which indicates that the CNN performs better at the front end of the interseasonal variability window and less well at the back end of the window. The index of agreement stays around 0.975 um, across the majority of the tropical Pacific Ocean and drops near the eastern boundary, and the root mean square error peaks around the central Pacific at about uh, 0.0035. So based on the metrics of the CNN filter, um, it performs well and retains the interseasonal variability. And so it can be applied to um, subseasonal forecasts. So the MJO forecast or MJO forecast of UFS was performed by Stefanova et al. And the figure is from Lee et al. The results of the MJO presentation of RMSE, an anomaly correlation of the RMM indices or the real-time multivariate MJO, in UFS prototypes 6 through 8 are shown. Prototype 6 is the blue line, prototype 7 is the red, and prototype 8 is green. Um, prototype 8 shows improved anomaly correlation and reduced RMSE in RMM 1 and 2. And the improvement in AC is contributed by both initial strong and weak MJOs. Um, and reduced RMSE is contributed by the strong MJOs. Overall, the MJO representation is, or sorry, overall, the MJO is represented in both prototypes with a slight improvement in prototype 8 versus prototype 6. For the MJO prediction, um, the figures show Hofmuller diagrams of the um, components of the wind power over the tropical Pacific Ocean for 2015 to 2016 averaged over five south to five north, with April 2015 indicated by the dashed black line. 
The first column shows the CFSR, that's the observations. The second column shows prototype six. Third column shows prototype eight. And the fourth column shows the difference between the prototypes. The first row shows the MJO component of the zonal wind stress anomalies. Um, the second row shows the Kelvin wave activity of zonal ocean surface current anomalies. And the third row shows the MJO wind power. The pattern correlation between prototype six and the observations for the MJO wind stress is 0.53, and for prototype eight it is 0.45. The pattern correlation with prototype six and the observations for the Kelvin wave activity is 0.65, for prototype eight is 0.67. And for wind power, prototype 6 is 0.39, and prototype 8 is 0.34. So prototype 8 shows a stronger MJO wind stress, Kelvin wave activity, and MJO wind power in April, May, and June than prototype 6. As you can see, the signal here is a little bit stronger here as well and in the wind power. And in the difference, those regions are green, indicating that prototype 8 is more positive. Uh, both prototypes have less overall Kelvin wave activity in April, May, and June compared to the observations. Um, here we see consistent red, but it doesn't follow through as well on the prototypes. Um, the pattern correlation of prototype 6 for the MJO wind stress and wind power is higher than prototype 8, but lower for the Kelvin wave activity. And neither of the prototypes captures the same intensity of the MJO wind stress or wind power in March 2015 that's shown in the observations. For ENSO prediction, um, the same um, approach as the previous slide, we have the um, SST anomalies for CFSR, prototype 6, prototype 8, and the difference between the prototypes. Um, and then the mean of 3 index here is this figure calculated for the observations as the black line, um, prototype 6 as the red bars, and prototype 8 as the blue bars. In the mean of 3 region of 150 west to 90 west and 5 south to 5 north, measured in degrees Celsius. Prototype 6 and 8 both have a later onset of sea surface temperature warming in the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. As you can see here, um, it's a little bit less in prototype 8, but prototype 6 is blue for a lot of this region over here. Um, and it's possibly due to prototype 6 and 8 not predicting the intensity of that March 2015 MJO that were in the observations. Um, prototype 8 has a warmer mean of 3, both in the Hof Muller and the index, and prototype 6 specifically in April. Um, you can see here that prototype 8 is a little bit warmer, and it shows up in the difference as well. It's much more green in this mean of 3 region. Um, in the mean of 3 index, it looks like um, prototype 6 is negative during April, but um, positive for um, prototype 8. And the overall correlation is uh, with observations is slightly higher in prototype 8 than prototype 6, where we have 0.93 for prototype 8 and 0.91 for prototype 6. The Nino 3 index indicates that UFS does predict the 1516 El Nino at the same magnitude as the observations. And the Hof Mollers show that the 1516 evolution is observed in. Um, that's in the observations is predicted by both models. They have the same um, relative shape. For the MJO and so relationship evaluation, the first column shows the make index, and these first two also show the CFSR Nino 3 index. Um, the second column shows the Mackey index. The first row shows CFSR as the lines and prototype 6 as the bars. Second row shows CFSR as the lines and prototype 8 as the bars. And the third row shows prototype 6 as the colored bars and prototype 8 as the black bars. Um, this was also calculated monthly for the 
uh, time period from April 2011 to March 2018, as indicated by the x-axis here. Um, so the 1516 El Nino event was not significantly influenced by MJO as in the observations, and this is supported by the results in prototype 6 and 8 as well. Now, none of them dropped below that negative 2 standard deviation threshold. Um, and also, um, prototype 8 predicts a higher make index than prototype 6 for April 2015. Um, a little bit hard to see, but this region right here indicates April and the prototype eight bar is higher than prototype six, not by a significant amount. It's a few tenths of a standard deviation, but it's still a difference. Um, and it predicts slightly lower than what the CFSR for Nino 3 shows for prototype eight. Um, it doesn't surpass the make index, but it almost reaches the Nino 3 index for April, which is something interesting to note. Um, and so the NJO wind power variability is what we look at when we look at the Mackey index. And it's not strong for any of them, but prototype 6 does show a smaller Mackey than make for April 2015, whereas uh, prototype 8 does not change the value. Um, Prototype 6 is a little bit lower for Mackey. Um, and that means that the prototype 6 has more negative MJO wind power than prototype 8 for this period, which is evident in the uh, MJO wind power difference plot. So for discussion, prototype 6 shows a later El Nino onset, onset than prototype 8, has, uh, and it's shown through delayed eastward movement of the sea surface temperature anomalies and a weaker MJO. Prototype 8 shows a later El Nino onset than observations, but seems to be compensated by that larger MJO and Kelvin wave activity in April, May, and June. Um, the 1516 El Nino is predicted by the models and confirms that for this El Nino event, the MJO influence was not significant for event growth. And for future work, um, there could be an analysis for thermocline depth data from prototype six and eight, and compared to the observations um, from the previous study by Leibarger and Stan in 2018, um, El Nino events influenced by MJO winds have earlier onset of a flattened thermocline, and El Nino events that are not influenced by MGO have a later onset with the transient like thermocline in periods of upwelling Kelvin wave activity. So if prototype six and eight show a later onset, then that could be added evidence of non-MJO influenced El Nino event growth. For part two, this is where I talk about the NSSTM impact on the MJO and so relationship. So the near sea surface temperature model or the NSSTM is used in air sea flux calculations at the forecast depth to add a vertical temperature profile below the sea surface temperature to improve SSD. And a schematic of it is shown here, where it combines the diurnal warming profile and the skin layer cooling profile to make this um, diurnal near sea surface temperature uh, profile. It's used in UFS prototype 8 on the wind stress or the surface turbulent momentum flux calculation in the atmospheric component. From UFS prototype 8, uh, the wind stress computation. The effects of the temperature occur in the perturbation term. And so by adding the NSSTM to prototype 8 wind stress, there's a possibility that the NSSTM could impact the forecast of the wind stress. This impact would be visible in the higher frequency noise, the MJO component, or both. And so if the NSSTM impacts the wind stress, it could also impact the MJO and so relationship. To address the second question, the impact of the NSSTM will be evaluated through the comparison of the prototypes and observations for each of the following. The total daily zonal wind stress anomalies, the filtered zonal wind stress anomalies, the MJO component of wind stress, and the MJO wind power. The comparison is done through the calculation of the pattern correlations and the difference between the prototypes, as well as the difference between the prototypes and the observations. For the total wind stress anomaly comparison, 
The top row shows the CFSR results, prototype 6 with the pattern correlation, prototype 8 with the pattern correlation, the difference between the prototypes, and the second row shows the difference between the observations and the respective prototypes. So the pattern correlation for prototype 6, total wind stress anomalies are 0.51. Prototype 8 is also 0.51. Um, and prototype 8 and 6, despite having the same pattern correlation, uh, prototype 8 does have instances or less instances of spatial differences, such as between uh, prototype 6 and the observations. Whereas with prototype 8, it's mostly uh, magnitude differences, and this is possibly due to the inclusion of the NSSTM. Um, prototype 8 is stronger than prototype 6 and CFSR, specifically in April, May, and June, where we have more green in the differences in both of these plots. Um, prototype 8 has less negative uh, wind stress anomalies than prototype 6. In the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean, we see more purple anomalies over here. And the, difference the differences between prototype 6 and 8 are on the same order of magnitude as the total anomalies. So for the filtered wind stress anomaly comparison, prototype or the pattern correlation for P6 is 0 0.5 and for P8 is 0.53. Um, so the P8 pattern correlation is slightly higher than P6, possibly indicating that the interseasonal variability prediction is improved by the NSSDM. Um, the differences between prototypes 6 and 8 from the total anomaly field do persist when filtered for interseasonal variability. That same pattern here that was here uh, is retained uh, when you filter out the noise, meaning that the changes to the wind stress perturbation terms are affected in both high frequency and interseasonal frequency. It's possible that the diurnal skin layer variability influences the interseasonal variability. And so if the changes to the prototype 8 wind stress only impacted the high frequency noise, the differences between prototype 6 and 8 for the interseasonal variability would not persist here. For the uh, MJO wind stress comparison, the pattern correlation for prototype 6 is 0.53, and for prototype 8, it is 0.45. So the pattern correlation for prototype 8 um, does drop when the interseasonal variability is isolated for the MJO component. But that same uh, difference between prototype 6 and 8 stays when you find the or isolate the MJO component. And the differences between the observations and the prototypes are also persistent. So this means that the changes between prototype 6 and 8 for the wind stress calculation affect the MJO component specifically, though it's possible that the diurnal skin layer variability influences the MJO component. For the MJO wind power comparison, um, the pattern correlation for prototype 6 is 0.39, and for prototype 8 is 0.34. And those same differences are still here and the same magnitude, um, meaning that the changes aren't coming from the ocean currents and are due to the changes in the calculation of the wind stress. Doesn't have anything to do with any the um, the Kelvin component. So it's possible that the diurnal skin layer variability influences the MJO wind power, which would impact the MJO and so relationship. So there are differences between prototype 6 and 8 wind stress anomalies that persist through filtering out the high frequency noise and isolating the MGO component. Um, even though prototype 8 doesn't show a necessarily improved uh, MGO wind stress or wind power versus prototype 6. Um, and so it's possible that the diurnal skin layer variability influences the interseasonal variability. So this means that the changes made in the prototype 8 wind stress computation do impact the MJO and so relationship, resulting in a larger make and match value during the El Nino growth period that we observed in those plots. 
However, due to the nature of this analysis, the changes cannot solely be attributed to the addition of the NSSTM in the UFS GCM atmospheric component for prototype 8, so further analysis would have to be performed. And so for overall conclusions, the Make and Mackey indices proposed by Lieberger et al. in 2020 can identify the 2015-2016 El Nino event in observations and in UFS and classify its growth as not significantly influenced by NJO. This case study is an example of how the Make and Mackey indices can be used on monthly forecasts to predict the likelihood of an El Nino event and the NJO influence on event growth when NJO and Kelvin wave activity co-vary with El Nino SSTAs. Make is comparable to the Nino 3 index while incorporating atmospheric components, which supports the use of Make as an alternative and so predictor. Prototypes 6 and 8 show persistent differences of the same magnitudes as the subtracting terms for the wind stress computations, which could in part be attributed to the addition of an NSSTN in prototype 8. And when these differences are considered with the Nino 3 SSTAs for April as the El Nino onset month, the MAKE index predicts a slightly more positive amplitude for prototype 8 than prototype 6. And so both are still below the CFSR MAKE index, but prototype 8 almost um, is equivalent to the CFSR Nino 3. So further work could include performing this analysis for a larger monthly reforecast data set with multiple NGO influenced and non influenced El Nino events and incorporating an analysis of the thermocline. But finally, I would like to thank UCAR and the TC for the opportunity to participate in the visitor program. And I'd specifically like to thank um, Jenny and Eric. I would also like to thank Tara, Hank, Minna, Tina, John, Dan, and George for working with me and assisting me with the Met Plus contributor and user functionalities. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, get my... <laughs> So uh, does anybody have any questions for Lauren? I think just speak up because I'm not sure I can see everyone. If I'm not seeing any hands raised, but um, you can also put a comment in the comment section. So I guess I, I'll ask a question. Um, so, so in the visiting the with the DTC, you used uh, Met Plus to do any of these? I, I guess it says you did. So yeah. how, how did you find your experience using Met Plus? Um, I, it was it was hard to learn, um, but then once I was more familiar with it, it was a little bit easier to use. Um, but um, I, from a more of the development side, contributor side, it was easier to use than as a user, I would say. Interesting. <laughs> so it's easier to contribute than to actually use it. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions to make it easier for the users? Um, I think I think we talked about it when I was there. Um, definitely updating the um, the user guide um, to make it, I guess, more concise because it, it it's useful, but it's also blocks of text, so it's hard to read through all of it to find specifically what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, but I think that was um, being improved when I was there last year. OK. So that sounds like a nice uh, contribution that you made for us then. <laughs> so anybody else have any questions for Lauren? I guess if not, then um, we'll thank Lauren again. I guess you, you can do these uh, little icons, I guess, is the way to do it. Um, thank you very much, Lauren. And um, I hope you had a good visit with our program. And um, hopefully, we'll see you around here again. Yes. And, and good luck 
with your with uh, finishing your degree. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 